Hello, welcome back. This is chapter 26, section 5, Origin of the Magnetic Field. Magnetic fields are produced by moving electric charges. We've already seen that electric charges respond to electric fields and electric charges produce electric fields. It's also the case with magnetism. We've previously seen how moving electric charges respond to magnetic fields, and now we're gonna see how moving electric charges produce magnetic fields. That relationship was first discovered between electricity and magnetism in 1820, when the Danish scientist Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that a compass needle is deflected by an electric current. So two scientists, one was uh, Bio and the other Savar, they mathematically figured out what's going on, this relationship with how moving electric charges produce a magnetic field, and they came up with the bio savar law. You can see this picture that's here to the right. Here we have a current, you can think of it as a stream of charges, and we've got some point P, some distance away from that current. And what Bio and Savar came up with was how the magnetic field at point P is produced by this current. Let's take a look at the picture. We've got purposely a current of a, kind of a random orientation and shape right there. We have the vector DL and that is just a small incremental vector. It's pointing in the direction of current. And we also have the R vector. I haven't written out R vector, but you can think of R vector as pointing from that point to point P. And in the equation, there's gonna be R hat. So R hat is the unit vector that points from DL toward point P. And of course, there's the angle theta in between them. The Biot-Savar law says that a small incremental uh, magnetic field contribution, we'll call it dB, is equal to some constant, mu naught over four pi, I'll talk about that in a minute, times the cross product of current times dL, cross producted with r hat, divided by r squared. Now let's talk about that constant that's off to the left, mu naught over four pi. Mu naught is called the permittive, I'm sorry, the permeability constant or the permeability of free space. And a minute ago, you heard me almost misspeak and say permittivity constant. Remember that epsilon naught is the permittivity constant. Well, now with magnetism, we have the permeability constant, otherwise known as the permeability of free space. It's exactly four pi times 10 to the negative seven, and the units are newtons per ampere squared. The units can also be thought of as Tesla meters over amperes. You notice that in this equation, you're gonna be doing very often mu naught divided by four pi, and if mu naught is four pi times 10 to the negative seven, and you're dividing by four pi, that just will become 10 to the negative seven. That equation gives the, the little increment of magnetic field. Now, when we take it over the entire, uh, the entire current, maybe the entire wire, we get that the magnetic field is the integral of all the little dBs. Mu naught over four pi is a constant, so we'll put that to the side of the integral, and we're left with mu naught over four pi times the integral of IDL times R hat over R squared. So that is the Biot-Savar law. There's the equation again at the top. And let's go straight to an example, the example 26.4 in the book. It says, find the magnetic field produced by an infinitely long straight wire carrying a steady current I. And of course, we're probably uh, never gonna come across an infinitely strong or an infinitely long straight wire that stretches across the universe and beyond, but it makes for a good approximation when we're talking about a very long wire compared to the distance that we're judging the magnetic field away from that wire. 
So let's look at the picture. It's the same picture that's shown in the book on example 26.4. We've got a long wire. It goes very far distance to the right, very far distance to the left, and we'll have the current go from left to right. We have a point P, and we want to judge what is the magnetic field right there at point P. And we're going to relate it to the various magnetic field contributions from all along the wire. But let's take it from this point where my marker's at right here. We're going to need our vector DL, so that's located at the point in question, and it's pointing in the direction of current. R hat is the unit vector that points towards our point P. Notice we have this right triangle that's set up. Y is the distance from the wire to point P, the perpendicular distance. X is going to be the distance along the wire that you see there. And what's going to become important is the distance between point P and the point on the wire that we're looking at the magnetic field contribution. That's the hypotenuse of the triangle. It's R. And pretty soon we're going to be turning that into a function of X and Y. So remember that that R is square root of X squared plus Y squared. All right, with all that in mind, let's look at it. First, we need to think of the direction of the magnetic field contribution. And again, we're looking at this point right here, and we've got our vectors D, L, and R, and we see that magnetic field is the cross product of those. So doing a cross product, we've got them lined up tail to tail, and we can curl our fingers from D, L into R hat, and our thumb points out of the page. Also, the magnitude of this cross product is going to be, remember the magnitude of a cross product is the magnitude of the first times the magnitude of the second times the sine of the angle between them. Well, the magnitude of the first vector is dl. r hat is a unit vector, so its magnitude is one, and then times sine theta. So we have dl times one times sine theta, or simply dl times sine theta. We can also see that sine theta is y over r. That's the basic trigonometry there. Now, really, when we do uh, trigonometry and we think so katoa, it's really the sine of this angle where my marker is. That's not actually theta. However, uh, that angle inside the triangle, its sine is the same as the sine of angle theta. So it's really the same. We'll say sine theta is y over r. Remember, r is x squared plus y squared square rooted. And so dl sine theta, which is uh, what we got from the magnitude of the cross product, dl sine theta is dl times y over square root of x squared plus y squared. Now, as I turn the page, all of these relevant equations are going to be at the top of the page. All right, there's our picture at the top. There's the integral that we're going to solve. And what I uh, just talked about on the previous page, there's dl sine theta, which is shown here. Okay, let's put it all together. We start with db is mu naught over 4 pi times the cross product dl cross r hat over r squared. And let's make some substitutions here. We've got that constant mu naught times current over 4 pi. We're not going to mess with that. We have the cross product dl cross r, which is dl sine theta. And here, this is what I've done in green. That's dl sine theta right there. And we are dividing by r squared, which remember means dividing by 1 over x squared plus y squared. We then consolidate all these terms. And we have mu naught i over 4 pi times y dl over, and you notice up here, x squared plus y squared to the 1 half. Here's x squared plus y squared to the first power. And so it leaves us with x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves power. So this is db. This is the db that we're going to plug into the, uh, the integral equation. All right, so there's db at the top of the page. Now, the integral equation 
has dl but we're just gonna we're gonna take this along the dimension of x current is in the dimension of x y is constant because p is just a, a fix some value y away from the wire so we're basically going to turn dl into dx what that gives us is the entire magnetic field is the sum of all the little magnetic field contributions and then plugging in here's db up at the top of the page and anything that is constant as usual we'll put on the outside of the integral so the constants are mu naught i y over four pi what's inside the integral what's left is here's the dx it formerly was dl at the top of the page but now i'm calling it dx over x squared plus y squared to the three halves power and our limits of integration are negative infinity to infinity because x stretches remember this is an infinitely long wire stretching from negative infinity to positive infinity we have an integral to take here and this is where it helps to have a good table of integrals so we look up in a table of integrals and we look for this pattern right here and in my table of integrals the integral of dx over x squared plus or minus a constant squared to the three abs power that constant in the table is given as a equals plus or minus x over a squared square root of x squared plus or minus a squared so this is the pattern we're going after and the plus in our integral means we're going to use those plus signs and so here it is taking that integral we get x over y squared times square root of x squared plus y squared again just copying from what i see in the purple box here and we're integrating that as x goes from negative infinity to positive infinity well one thing we can do is factor out that one over y squared so here i've moved it out to the side y over y squared just puts a y in the denominator and we're left with x over x squared plus y squared square rooted and going from negative infinity to positive infinity when you plug those in you should get for infinity for x infinity you should get simply one because it basically becomes infinity over infinity one and then for negative infinity you should get negative one so it's one minus negative one which is two that whole integral becomes two and so now we're left with the magnetic field is mu naught i over two pi y now thinking practically uh, here's a wire i've drawn the wire going into the page and this is what the magnetic field looks like the magnetic field its magnitude is the constant the permeability constant times the current divided by two pi and the distance away from the wire so here i'm calling that distance r because that's how we normally see the formula r is the distance away from the wire notice what magnetic field is based on it's based on the current so the stronger the current the more magnetic field and it falls off with the distance i also want you to see the direction of the magnetic field it goes in concentric circles around the wire now there's a new right hand rule for this a very easy one uh, you see in this picture the wire is going into the page so what i want you to do with your right hand uh, take your right hand and imagine that you are grabbing hold of that wire and your thumb points in the direction of current so you you pretend you're grabbing that wire thumb points into the page and you notice if you're doing this with your right hand you notice the direction that your fingers curl they curl in a circle they go in the direction of the magnetic field let's look at this interesting example let's say that we have two parallel currents two wires i've called the first one i1 and i2 representing their different currents and i want to think about their effect on each other two wires with currents going through them i1 the one on the left it produces a magnetic field b1 now let's use the right hand rule i just taught you imagine you're grabbing with your right hand grabbing that wire 
and your thumb points up, so in the direction of the current, and notice the way that your, uh, that your fingers curl. On the right of I1, they go into the page. To the left of I1, I haven't drawn this, but they come out of the page. But we're concerned with what is the magnetic field produced in the vicinity of I2, so it goes into the page. So now given the magnetic field one, and that's something that we could calculate based on the equation I gave on the previous page, we could calculate its magnitude. But given the magnetic field B1, what is the direction of the force exerted on I2? So now that we have that magnetic field present, what is the force it exerts on I2? Use the right hand rule. So for that, you can have your hand outstretched, fingers fully extended, pointing up in the direction of the current. Now rotate your, uh, your arm in such a way that your fingers can curl into the page. And your thumb of your right hand should be pointing to the left, which means that wire, I2, should be pulled to the left. So the current I2, and hence the wire that it's going through, is being attracted, it's being pulled to the left, towards I1. Now I wanna look at what effect is being had on current I1. How is I1 being forced? Well, two ways you can approach this, one way, is to do the similar procedure to what we just did for I2. So you think I2 is producing a magnetic field. Current two produces a magnetic field. To see the direction of the magnetic field, use your new right-hand rule. So we're gonna to pretend to grab wire two, grab it with our right hand, thumb points up in the direction of current. And you can see in the vicinity of I1, your fingers come out of the page. So that's the magnitude of the magnetic field. Now that we have that magnetic field that you can see that I've drawn on the page, let's figure out using another right-hand rule, the first right-hand rule that I taught you in a previous video, what is the direction that I1 is being forced? You can already see on the page the answer, but let's work it out for ourselves. Let's point our hand with our outstretched fingers up in the direction of current one, rotate our arm in such a way that our fingers point out of the page in the direction of the magnetic field, so they're probably pointing towards your face, and your thumb points to the right. And you can see I've drawn that force right there. So I1 is being pulled towards I2. So I1 and I2 are mutually attracting each other. Now, an easier way to have answered the question, what is the effect on I1, is simply to use Newton's third law. Because I2 is being attracted to I1, Newton's third law says I1 must be attracted to I2. Now, let's figure out the magnitude of these forces. The force acting on wire two is current times length times B. All right, so let's think about that. The force acting on I2 is, uh, is I2 times the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field times, and here is the magnitude of the magnetic field that's caused by current one. This is what we saw for earlier using the Bios of our law. It's mu naught times I1 over two pi times the distance between the two wires. So I'll rearrange some of those terms, and we get that the force between the wires is mu naught times current one times current two times the length of the wires divided by two pi and their distance. And by the way, you could do the same uh, procedure if the currents are anti-parallel, meaning they're going in the same direction, but one is going up, the other's going down, then they will repel each other. And it could be a good practice going through the procedure on this page and the previous one that you actually work that out for yourself. It'll give you good practice in determining directions of magnetic fields and direction that magnetic fields that they uh, cause a force on a wire. So I recommend you work out for yourself and see that I1 and I2, if they're anti-parallel, that they will repel each other. That is the end of section 26.5 the origin of the magnetic field. Have a great day.